Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallam ala Sayyid al Awwalin wa al Akhirin, Nabiyana Muhammadan, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa ba'd. All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be constantly showered upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, the master of the first and the last, and upon his family, his companions, and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is a great privilege and honor again uh, to be with you here in Trinidad. And every time I come back to the region, uh, it's like a homecoming uh, for me. My grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, left Barbados in 1930. And she settled in the United States, married an African American. Uh, my wife is Jamaican. Alhamdulillah, I lived in the region for over four years and been here many times. And so every time I come back, um, there's an emotional thing for me because it's like somebody coming home, especially coming in the month of January when it is freezing in Toronto now. Uh, and I said to the brother, you know, we had a warm day when I left. It was five degrees centigrade. People were taking their coats off. Um, and so to be here in the tropics, and the rain is coming and the sun and to be back uh, is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I believe that this really is the place that all human beings actually should live. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I want our session tonight to be uh, a joyous session, uh, to be a family-oriented session, but at the same time, I want to share with you some of the understanding that I got from traveling to over 63 countries to living in the Muslim world and as a young uh, new Muslim very innocent open-minded traveling and meeting people meeting the scholars and trying to understand what is happening to us and today it is so important for us to answer that question because we are coming out of the COVID-19 uh, era and people are returning to the masjids, returning to normal life, but the world again has changed. And so we need to be uh, adaptable. We need to have the wisdom to understand what is happening around us, to analyze this in the light of the last revelation and in the light of the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, to be able to set some framework for the continued spread of Islam and hopefully our children can stay on the path. And so I want to first introduce this three-part series. This is the first part of three important uh, understandings of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it came about really with the travel that I did and with under trying to understand the Muslim world. I don't know if everybody can see from over here, but I will tell you um, what is on the slide. Let's look at the background and why we are studying what we are studying. If we look at the Muslim world today, you will find that there is great potential in the Muslim world. We make up over 26% of the Earth's population and we are rising. And you will be surprised to know that Islam is the majority religion on the African continent. I had the opportunity to live in South Africa for 10 years and to travel to 20 African countries. Islam also the largest Muslim populations are not in Arabia but in India, Indonesia, 
These are the largest Muslim populations. In Europe, you will be surprised to know that the majority of people in Paris and Marseille who are 26 years old and under are Muslims. In Belgium, in Holland, 50% of the children born in the hospitals right now are Muslims. So quiet as it's kept, we are rising. There are people still entering Islam. And so Allah blessed us with population. Allah also blessed us with natural resources. Over 50% of the valuable minerals of the world lie under Muslim countries. Our countries lie on strategic positions, strategic waterways, strategic mountain passes. We have young people. The majority of Muslims are young people. If you were to take all of the Muslims and put them on one field, you will find the majority under 20 years old. So we are a growing young population. We also have huge standing armies, hundreds and thousands of men at arms. We have a history, strong history of respect. Our sacred sources are still there for us. The other religions cannot go back to their original source. And so they have to continue to revise what they have. We are blessed with the original source. So even if somebody tries to change it, we can go back to the original to find out whether that person is telling the truth or not. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with great potential. But the question that I asked, and many young people are asking, with this great potential, with some of the richest people on earth living in the Muslim countries, many of you watched the World Cup and you saw Qatar and the standard of living on the UAE. With some of the richest people on the face of the planet earth, why is it that we have some of the poorest people. That's a contradiction. With standing armies that we have, why is it that people are crying out, Mashtar al-Aqsa in Palestine is still under attack. Muslims are still finding themselves at the brunt of Islamophobia. The scholars in many places spend their time arguing over minor points, furu'a, instead of dealing with usul, which are the principal points. And so this is the question. This leads to a type of frustration. And I looked in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What could Allah azza wa jal tell us? And in Surah Al-Hasha, verses 18 to 19, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim." Ya ayuha al-ladina amanu taqu Allah, wal tando nafsun ma qadma liqad, wa taqu Allah. Inna Allah khabirun bima ta'malun. Wala takunu kaladina nasu Allah, fa ansahum anfusahum. Ula ikahum al-fasiqun. Allah tells us, "O you who believe, have the consciousness of Allah." And let every soul look to what it put forward for tomorrow and fear Allah. Surely Allah is well aware of all that you do. And be not as those who forgot Allah. And so he made them forget themselves. Surely they are the disobedient ones. So with the divine use of three letters, nasiya. Allah said, لا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم You forget Allah, He will make you forget yourself. Your money will not be spent for the poor. Your armies will not liberate the oppressed people. This is a contradiction. 
And again I searched, how can we come out of this? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us in His mighty book, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. So there's something inside of us as individuals, our families, our Muslim world, there's something that needs to go through a change. The internal Muslim, right to the heart. And today in Juma, I was discussing with the brothers and sisters the importance of sincerity. That in this year, 2023 of the solar calendar, you could say it's a year of survival. We have to survive an onslaught of immorality. We have to survive an onslaught of the climatic change. And even here you felt the floods. Imagine how it was like in Pakistan. Imagine what it was like in California right now when the water is coming down. And so this is a year of survival and in this year we need to be sincere with Allah Azza wa Jal. One of the areas of this sincerity is sincerity to the book of Allah. We have to be sincere to the Quran itself. A great scholar of Islam, an African scholar, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk of the city of Fez. Many of you got to know the Moroccan team. People watch the World Cup. The Moroccans defeated the Spanish. They defeated the Portuguese. Who are the Moroccans? Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, a great scholar in Fez, he said, if you want to be sincere to the book of Allah, you need three things. Tahseen tilawatihi, wa tadabbur ayatihi, wa itba awamirihi. You must first perfect the recitation, beautify with tajweed. Secondly, tadabbur ayatihi, you must think about the verses, contemplate, reflect upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And finally, you need to implement this, put this into practice. This is the complete sincerity that we need. And Allah Azza wa Jal has given us so many examples in His book. Allah has given us parables, parables of the prophets, parables of the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. And within the book itself, there is a lot of deep knowledge. So I want to extract some knowledge and reflect upon a very important section of the book of Allah, and that is concerning insects. I want to do something a little bit different now. The young people who are here, if you can, can you see the uh, board there? You can see it? Okay, any young person who can't see it, then move over so you can see, because this is a visual presentation as well as just an audio presentation. We want to look at the miracle of the ant. And this takes us to Surat al -Namal the chapter of the ant. Now you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed chapters using the name of insects. One of them is Surat al -Namal. And people before used to say, okay, that's interesting, but what about it? Let's look at the miracle of the ant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in his book, in Surah al naml verse 15, I'll do the translation, it's a little bit long of some of it, and read the Arabic of some. So Allah has revealed, indeed we granted knowledge to Dawood and Sulaiman, and they said in acknowledgement, Alhamdulillah, all praise for Allah, 
who has made us excel over many of his faithful servants. And Daoud was succeeded by Suleiman, who said, O people, we have been taught the language of birds and been given everything we need. This is indeed a great privilege. Suleiman salam, was given something no other prophet was ever given before. That is the ability to communicate with insects, to communicate with the jinn. No other human being has ever been given something like this before. And in the 18th verse, Allah told us, And when they came across a valley of ants, Hatta ida atau ala wadin namal, call it namlatun ya ayuhan namal, udhulu masakinakum, la yahtimanakum suleiman, wajunu duhu, wahum la yashuru. So this is the key point here. And it says, and when they came across a valley of ants, an ant spoke out and said, O oh, ants, go quickly into your homes so that Suleiman and his army do not crush you unknowingly. So this is the shahid within uh, this amazing chapter of the book. And when you look at it right from the beginning, those who are speaking Arabic, they see right away when it's speaking about the ant, it is saying, call it namlatun, female. Science has now shown us that the majority of the ants, the ants who are moving around all over the place that you are basically seeing are all females. They're not males. This is a miracle of the Quran. How could Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu know that the majority of the ants are actually female? Why would the Quran? Because this is the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so, the ant, she was selfless. Imagine now the huge army is coming. Instead of just running away, she calls out to the other ants and said, go into your homes. Go underground, go somewhere, so you will not get crushed. In other words, that ant was selfless. That ant was thinking about the other ants more than she thought about herself. And this is one of the important qualities that we need to understand about the ants. And this really came to me when I was living in Cape Town. And in Africa, in southern Africa, the ants are really aggressive. For some reason in Trinidad, I'm not seeing ants like I used to see. I don't know if they're using extermination or what it is. But I'm not seeing ants like I used to see. But in Africa, in Cape Town, in a middle class area, if you put down a piece of bread, in 15 minutes, there's a line of ants moving for the bread. One scout goes out and finds something, communicates it to the other, and suddenly they are moving in line. And one day I was doing dhikr, and I was sitting and I watched a line of ants going this way and the line going the other way. And when the ants were passing each other, they would not just go past, they would recognize each other. They communicate with each other. They don't communicate with their mouth. They have antennas. So they're in constant communication with each other. They are amazing creatures. As a matter of fact, we could say the ant is the most successful creature that has ever lived. This is a deep statement to make. It is the most successful creature. So there must be something about the ant that makes it successful, something why Allah Azza wa 
would put the namal inside of the Qur'an so that we could reflect, so that we could think about this and take lessons from the ants. There are over 12,000 species of ants. And they make up what is called scientifically one-sixth to one-fourth of the entire animal biomass. In other words, if you took all animals, living things, and you just put them all in a mass, one-sixth to one-fourth would be ants. That's how many ants there are in this world. For every human being, every one of us, there are 20 million ants. I don't know about Trinidad, I don't know where they went. Maybe they're underground. But there's 20 million ants for every human being. Think about this. The ants are so successful that they live in every single continent of the world except for one place. Anybody know without looking at the board where it is? Excellent, mashallah. Antarctica, I don't know why it's Antarctica. But Antarctica, there's no ants. Every single place in the world, China, Europe, Africa, India, the Americas, everywhere in the world, there are ants. And the ants, you know what's so interesting about them? And that is that a colony of ants can be about 10 million ants in a colony, but they will mix with other colonies and they can form what is called a super colony, which is billions of ants. Now, what is the miraculous thing about ants is that even though they are so much in number, they are one mind. All of the ants think together. So when one is thinking and communicating, there's a connection with the other ants within the colony itself. And so they function as one body. They communicate using their antennas. And I watched the ants in their communication moving around with each other. The scientists show that with their antennas, the ants can produce, they produce chemicals. And they can actually inform, tell the other ants there's danger up ahead. They can even show the other ants through chemicals and through their communication how to get to the food. That's why suddenly there was a line going for my piece of bread so fast. Because they communicate. They had no cell phone. They had no mass communication, no walkie-talkie. But they communicate with instinct what Allah Azza wa Jal naturally gave them. And when you are in the ant colony, there is no rebellion in the, constant, in the colony. There is no... Uh, Marxist, Leninist, the, the worker ants fighting against the bourgeoisie ants. There's no rebellion. As they would say, rebellion is futile. There is no rebellion. Because they live together. They learn to accept each other and move together as one body. And when the ants pass each other, and that's one thing that I noticed. I look really close at this. Every time an ant crossed another ant, they, he stopped with an antenna, she stops and gives salam. We would say gives salams. When one ant is moving across and there's three ants, she gives salam to the first ant and then nod to the other two. So she gave salam to the emir of the Jamaat. And for the rest of the people in the Jamaat, she then nodded to the rest. Because the Amir will then get across the Salam. But they will not pass each other. Think about Muslims today. The Prophet ﷺ said the time would come when there would be a Salam al-Khas. 
there would be a specialized salam that people would only give to members of their family or members of their tribe. And we notice this so much in our communities. Here, our community is fairly tight in terms of ethnicity. In our masjids, you will have people from all over the world. On Eid day, when people are supposed to be hugging each other as Muslims, they hug one person and then they look for someone else that looks like them. And then they give him salams and Eid Mubarak. And they look for some, their cousin or somebody else, passing other Muslims. That is what the Prophet ﷺ said, Salam al khas it's a specialized salam. And he was telling us this in order that we would be more aware of other Muslims. The ants are extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. You know, one ant can lift 50 times his weight. One ant. This is what they would call a superhero. 50 times his weight. You could take five automobiles, five cars, and he could lift them all up if you have the power of an ant. But even though the ant has this power, they do not use their strength against each other. They use it only if somebody who is attacking the colony. And think about it when we get a little bit of strength, we do a little exercise. We learn a little Arabic. We memorize a little Quran and suddenly I want to start my own masjid. I want to have my own jamaat. Because he thinks he has a little bit of power. The ants are the most successful creatures on earth. And Allah is pointing to us as Muslim. Why is this? And if you think about Muslims today in Trinidad just alone, or if you look at us in other parts of the world, in Canada, if all the Muslims were united, we would be a powerful block, a powerful body. But when division is between one masjid, one community, one ethnic group, and another, then you're just a lot of different communities. But when you have what is called Ummah consciousness, the Ummah, the nation, when you have that consciousness the ants have Ummah consciousness. There are all types of ants. There are male ants. Yes, there are males. And the drones, they just sit around and eat food and um, get the queen pregnant. There's the queen, who is the ultimate female. And the queen is special. The queen is special. And she is naturally the queen. She doesn't have to go to charm school to learn how to be a queen, to walk in a certain way, to talk in a certain way. It comes natural. And all of the ants respect. In some colonies, they even found there are certain ants that have big claws. And they actually, uh, they're like uh, machinery. They lift heavy things. There are other ants whose bodies are really strong and they are the ones who go to the front line if there is an attack. So there's all types of ants doing all types of activities, but yet and still, they work together. And you know what is one of the beautiful things about ants themselves? It's that teamwork, it's their character. The Prophet Sallallahu said in authentic hadith, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِيُتَمِّمَ مَكَادَمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ Verily, I have been sent to complete the best in character. That's the essence of your Islam. It's not your beard, it's not your tobe, it's not how tall your hat is. It's your character. You live as a Muslim. And the ants have this character. It's a beautiful quality. Imagine one ant can lift 50 times their weight, but yet they are polite with each other. An experiment was done with a group of ants in Argentina. You know Argentina too, they won the World Cup, right? 
An experiment was done in Argentina, and they made a maze. And they put the ants in the maze so it has little, uh, little lanes and corridors. And what they did, when you come to, you're going along a lane, and they blocked it. You go another one, they blocked it. And they found out that the more difficult it became is the more patient the ants became. Think about human beings. Think about us if you're in line and you know, people get unruly and start fighting each other. We even experience this when we're on Hajj. It can happen with human beings, but the ants, the more difficult it came when they did this experiment, is the more polite they were with each other. Because they realize that their success is the success of the Jamaat. It's not just their own success. And being patient is an amazing thing. And you see amazing feats the ants can do. I want you to take some time, especially our younger brothers and sisters, but everybody, look up ants. They're amazing creatures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made. This picture here, if you can see that mass right there, that is going through a stream. This is all ants. They stuck together to each other and they hung onto some wood and they floated together as a jamaat when the water was moving too fast. And because of that unity, they were able to cross the river in a way that they would not have been able to do if they were not united. The ants think positively. But sometimes even the ants get angry. And in one case, they evolve according to the situation. There was even an ant in, in America, in Texas, they said the ant of all ants and that these ants were attacking electronic devices. They were attacking the computers. And the Americans had to do, make all kinds of poisons. And when they make the poison, the ant evolves and, and he defeats the poisons. They said it was the ant of all ants. It was an unbelievable experience that they were having and, and to show what the ants can do. So what is the lessons, some of the lessons for uh, the Muslims today? Number one, the ants are in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have to be trained, they, they, go, they function naturally. Excellent character, politeness, hard work, acceptance of each other. Think about these qualities. We need to like workshop these. We need to in, you know, show this to our younger generation. Selflessness. It is said that in the battle of Mu'tah, when the Muslims were facing the Romans, and one of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu majma'in, he was wounded and he was calling out. He was calling out for water. And, and, and they came to him. And, and then he, he heard his brother. And so he said, don't give it to me. Give the water to my brother. And they went to the other one. He was calling out. And he went to the third person. And when they reached him, he had died, shaheed. They came to the second, he died, shaheed. And they came to the first, and he was shaheed. Selflessness. How do you think Islam spread so rapidly in the time of the Prophet ﷺ right up? In 100 years, Islam had entered China, far north in the Caucasoid Mountains, deep south on the Swahili coast all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, 100 years. Thinking in one mind, one mind. This is not easy. There may be some differences amongst us, but at the end of the day, we are all Muslims. We are the people of the Qibla. And we need to be able to look at each other for that which is similar instead of that which is different. So one of the things plaguing us, they'll look at somebody and say, look how he makes Salat. And he makes Salat a little bit different. He makes, he's a Maliki and he's wiggling his finger like this. He's wiggling his finger. 
And they're looking at him. I was in one country, I won't say which one it is, and, and the Imam read the Salat, so beautiful Salat al-Maghrib, and I said, Ameen. I was the only one in the mosque. So when they finished, they said, where's that shaitan? Where is it? And they came to get me and they said, brother, why? I said, get Sahih al-Bukhari. And you will see that the Sahaba said, Ameen, so loud, it shook the building. So you have the right to be silent or the right to say aloud. All of it is allowable within Sunnah. See? That's what knowledge can do. And so, this unity that we need to have, I call it operational unity. And that is, we have Muslims from different schools of thought, we have different Islamic movements, but we need to have operational unity. We learn to work together. If there's a difference, we discuss amongst each other. If we disagree, then we agree to disagree. But we still love each other. And we still protect each other. That is the example of the ants. Thinking positive. When the Prophet ﷺ would send his people out on a journey, he would tell them, Bashiru wa la tunafiru. Yassiru wa la tuhassiru. He would tell them, give glide, glad tidings. Don't drive people away. Make it easy. Make the religion easy. Don't make the religion difficult. That is the original way how the Muslims would function and how Islam began to spread. And I want to read, there is a, a famous, in a poem it said, courage isn't always a lion's roar. It's also the silence of ants working patiently, persistently, and never giving up. That is courage. To continue to work, to strive to overcome our differences, to think in one mind, to submit completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to take these examples, our Muslim world now has the potential to be the leaders of the planet. But if we continue as different ethnic groups of different, the rich and the poor, even different Islamic uh, movements, then we will continue to be conquered by alien enemies who will have no mercy on us. And so I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless us to have this feeling and understanding of the ants. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would raise up in our younger generation those who can break down differences and those who can appreciate other Muslims and appreciate people of other faiths and nationalities as well so that we can bring this world from darkness into light so that we can survive in a tidal wave of immorality which is surrounding us. A tidal wave of economic pressure. Everything is getting more expensive. It's getting more expensive in Trinidad too, right? Everything is getting expensive. But at the same time, there's, so, there's some rich people, the top percentage of people are richer than anybody has ever been in the world. So this is where humanity needs to come together. And I believe that Muslims can lead this cause if we would take the lessons from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put it into our lives. I leave you with these thoughts and I ask Allah to have mercy on me and you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.